Channel BBC One. And we must apologise for the delay in starting our next programme. We've just been informed that our star comedian is having a little difficulty in getting to the studio. For a minute, though. <laughs> no, honestly, you didn't really think that I'd expect some poor little old lady to, <laughs> to run around with nearly 11 stone on her back. Uh, news has reached us of a gigantic new publishing house takeover bid. A bid to take over a no less a publication than the Radio Times. Uh, the man behind it all is Mervyn Thud. Hello. <laughs> Uh, Mervyn, uh, you're a karate black belt, ex-European chess champion, Olympic gold medalist, successful dress designer, and now newspaper proprietor. How do you do all these things? Superbly. <laughs> when, did you, well, when did you first become interested in mass communications? When I first had a letter printed in a magazine. Well, why do you think they printed it? I can't tell you, cause why, because it was frank, and it was outspoken, it was controversial. Now, what did you say? I think your magazine is good value for eight pence. <laughs> and then I'd done that newspaper one, Be Your Own TV Cricket. I'd done that. Uh, what was it about? Well, it was these, like, two so-called comedians on there, and one says to the other one, Who was that lady I seen you with last night? And the other one said, That was no lady, that was my wife. <laughs> I wrote up right away. <laughs> well, it was a rather old joke. Is it? I hadn't heard it before. <laughs> and then why did you write him? Because why? Because of the disgusting implication that was implied. That was no lady, that was my wife. What a way for a man to talk about his wife. The woman who probably bored his children. <laughs> and he can, all he can say is, that was no lady, that was my wife. Well, I, I writ up right away, give the letter to my wife to post, I uh, did. Did they print it? No, she forgot to post it, the silly old crow. <laughs> oh, I did not thump her one. <laughs> But surely to take over a publication like the Radio Times will require enormous capital outlay. Well, we managed to get our economy next down. <laughs> and we hope to keep them down. Have you been subsidised? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who by? <laughs> I don't remember. What changes will you make? I shall make numerous and innumerable changes. For once I shall speak out. I shall sweep aside the veil of secrecy. I shall face facts and I shall name names. Now, who's your editor? I'd rather not say. <laughs> <laughs> can you give us an example of some of the sort of things we can expect? Yes, in the first edition, I shall do vice probe at the television center <laughs> by our show business correspondent. <laughs> Come now, there's no vice at the television centre. Let's take a bit far. I should be very careful if I was you, Mr. McGee, if that's your real name. <laughs> Otherwise, I shall deny those rumours that are going around about how you got your job with the BBC. <laughs> but there are no rumours. It can be arranged. <laughs> I can just see it now in big letters. Is there any truth in the rumour that Henry McGee is carrying on with the producer's wife? And then in little tiny letters underneath, we say no. <laughs> But I don't know any producer's wife. I know, but your wife wouldn't like to read that, would she, eh? 
you'd have no cocoa for a fortnight. <laughs> you'd go right off a marmalade, she would. But that BBC has no shoddy secret. No? Then why is it that Billy Cotton never appears on the other channel? <laughs> I'll tell you cause why. Because he's being kept prisoner. <laughs> and only allowed out to do his show. Then he's locked away again in a little room next to the ticket allocation unit where no one ever goes. <laughs> Yes, in the new Radio Times, I shall tell all just why Harry Seacombe dare not go back to his hometown of Glasgow. <laughs> why a certain member of the Burt Rhodes Orchestra changed his sax. <laughs> just how many of the black and white minstrels are illegal immigrants. <laughs> and the truth about Malcolm Muggeridge and Lulu. <laughs> But it won't always be exposing things. It will have its lighter side. I believe you've actually made a commercial about it. Yes, I have. So stand by, folks. It's all happening with the new Radio Times. <laughs> it's time to go. It's coming your way soon. The new Radio Times. It's educational. Men's Fashion Forum with friendly get set up. Hurry work. Glamour with the lovely Dandy Nichols. Provocative <laughs> Kathleen Harrison. And Sultry for a Hearn. <laughs> Off to with Alan Wicker. Keep set with Cliff Mitchellmore. Readers complaint. I should like to complain about the standard of acting on Captain Scarlet and the Mr. On. <laughs> I have never seen such wooden performances in my whole life. <laughs> it's even worse than dead cars, and you can forgive them because they are puppets. <laughs> Also, I should like to complain about the violence on commercial television. I think it's disgusting when they have a big P. <laughs> and they won't let it into the packet. <laughs> I think the program is called Cannonball. <laughs> also, some of the commercials are most misleading. One of them implies that if you use a certain kind of hair cream, you will become a black belt at Karachi and Jewish Jitsu. <laughs> also, that you will be a junior executive and drive around in a fast continental sports car and have a mad Mayfair model to accompany you. I have been using that hair cream for 12 years. <laughs> I couldn't knock the skin off a rice pudding. <laughs> I earn eight pounds a week as a saga maker's bottom knocker's labourer's assistant. I have a second-hand bicycle, which is not yet paid for. <laughs> and the only female who will accompany me on that is the old boiling piece from the slaughterhouse. <laughs> and she'll only come with me since I've had the three-speed removed. <laughs> Your sincerely disgusted council flat, Bond Street, W1. <laughs> Notice, but when you see um, a two-hour cinema film put on television for about an hour and a half, you know, naturally several scenes have to be cut. Now, if this is done by an expert, you hardly notice it. But if it's done by J. Arthur Scuttle, <laughs> it looks like this. join me. Why, I'd love to. <laughs> oh, honey, almost forgot. I got a little present for you. Is it a surprise? I think you'll like it. Why, Harry, it's beautiful. I don't like these experiments you keep doing, Harry. It's dangerous. I don't make mistakes. Never? Not Harry Johnson. Harry! 
Haven't you noticed anything different about me? No. I'm wearing those new earrings you bought me. Well, bully for you, baby. Mm -hmm. mm, bye. Bye. Don't forget Mary's coming over to dinner. Try and shoot at the duck. Okay, I'll do what I can do. Make sure you don't miss. <laughs> thing I ever saw. Why, thank you. I had it on a top load. Hello, Annie Claire. Why, Timmy, my, how you've changed. <laughs> now, now, naughty, naughty, don't get mad. Here, honey, I've got something for you. Uh, can you catch? Yeah, sure I can. Yeah. What do you gotta say to that, eh? Ooh, that hurts. Oh, <laughs> come on, Jimmy. Don't be such a baby. Harry. Oh, yeah. You've got a boy. A boy. And? And? A duck. A duck? <laughs> Well, you never did shoot that duck you promised me, Harry. <laughs> no, he shot a monster instead. Ah! Oh, oh, I said it! Billy Bunny didn't know if I have a skin full last night. I wouldn't have his head this morning for all the tea in China. with Billy Bunn, and the time is now two minutes past 7 a.m. <laughs> it's quest time, and here for Mrs. Eatwell of Sycamore Street. <laughs> Eaton, she would like either the grapefruit, or the cream, or the marmalade. Well, we've got one on the turntable for you now, and I'll tell you which one it is. It's a <laughs> Oh, ho, ho. Well, here we go. Crazy man, crazy, crazy. to introduce the delightful Tammy Jones. Baby, don't. 
Bibi de Barbès. Jambon Tris. Cabinet en face. These are just some of the magnificent films from the French avant-garde film director Claude Letuit. <laughs> Bonsoir. Mes hommages, cher maître. Merci. You know, you speak very well the French. <laughs> Merci. Now, for me, your most magnificent film was Cabinet en face. I think it was a masterstroke to make this beautiful girl who had this, this angst, this savoir-faire. She was so beautiful, so nearly perfect, yet you gave her a lisp. <laughs> Meaning that she wasn't really nearly No, so no, no, you misunderstand. I, I don't give her a lisp. The actress who played the part, she have always lisp. <laughs> and she always told like that. She always has the lisp. You searched all France for an actress with a lisp. No, 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 I, I don't find her. She was, she was discovered by a producer who was living with her at the time. <laughs> but I didn't want her in the film, but you know. Wonderful. Now, uh, to, to me, the best scene in the film was that scene in the restaurant, uh, when she looked up into his eyes and said, Je prends les mots, les manières. I want a life in the grand manner. No, 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 no. She says, uh, Je prends les moules marinières. <laughs> uh, I want muscle soup. <laughs> Their muscle soup. <laughs> she, she, she searched for her nourishment in, in, in the depths of, of the ocean. Yes, There's nothing more to be said. <laughs> and then in that scene at the end, where she's sitting alone in the great wastes of the Carmarg, and the little dog runs up to her, lies on his back in front of her, and for me this scene summed up the whole film. It's a dog's life. How did you get him to do it? Well, I, I don't know who's is this dog. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, for me, it spoiled the, the scene, you know. I have no more films to make. The dog run across, and then I put my camera down, and he run over with the leg, you know. Um, and I cannot use the camera anymore because he's all rusty, you know. If, if I tell you, if I know who's is that dog, I'll kill him. I'll ki kill the dog as well, you know. Formidable. We are now going to see a Claude Letwitz's first English film. It's a trilogy called Seesaws, Roundabouts and Swings. Or in French, <laughs> Monsieur Letwitz. <laughs> and this... The life of an actor has always been up and down, but none more so than that of Oliver Mandrakes. For England, for glory, but you, my friends, will know he died for love. Nice, light, white hat. I have a 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 nice, light, white hat. Oh, you have a nice, light, white hat. <laughs> you know, you never listen to what I'm saying, do you? You made I cry. You made I cry. You made me cry. <laughs> By George, she's got it. She's really got it. Well done, my child. <laughs> well done.
Evangeline, oh, won't you buy my pretty lavender? Evening, man. Oliver? Oliver Mandrake? Mary! In his home at Brown Paper Castle, Lord Brown Paper was getting tired of the daily ride. <coughs> has, has he gone yet? Has who gone? Has the vicar gone? Yes, he's gone. And it wasn't the vicar, it was the doctor. I thought he was a bit familiar for the vicar. <laughs> the doctor says you've got flu. And it would be better if we were to occupy separate rooms for the next few days. Oh, poo! You know I don't like sleeping on my own. Well, that's what the doctor said. Oh. I suppose the doctor knows best. It's home! Oh. All, sir. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Smithers. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, Smithers. <laughs> thank you very much, Doctor. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> What did the doctor have to say? He says we must keep to our separate rooms for another few days. Will you mind very much? So the doctor's over there. I'm sure he does. <laughs> similarity ends, for George was bright and intelligent. Arthur just couldn't do anything right. <laughs> George was athletic. <laughs> Arthur was not. <laughs> George was smart and sophisticated. did everything just right. If anything, he was a little too perfect. <laughs> and Arthur, clumsy though he was, did have a certain awkward charm. Arthur, it's all right to have an olive in the martini, but not in your wine. And like a swing, Edwina's affection went to and fro. Should she marry George? Or should she marry Arthur? <laughs> she married George. Arthur was shattered. Life without Edwina was unthinkable. He decided to end it all. But he couldn't even do that right. <laughs> and so Edwina married Arthur. And since that day, everything Arthur did was just right.
point, the great Nemo, the fastest quick-change artist in the world, was to have presented an excerpt from Oliver Twist, but owing to an indisposition, he will not now be with us. <laughs> but we have been fortunate in securing, at very short notice, the services of the one and only Arnold Lurch. <laughs> Eight o'clock on Christmas Eve. I have an appointment. I have a rendezvous. A rendezvous. I've anticipated with much relish. Fagin! Fagin! <laughs> Where are you, Fagin? Ah, uh, the old dodderer's got a might death in his old age. Fagin! Fagin! <laughs> Give these old bones of mine, my dear. Fagin, Fagin, ask Lancy. Ask Lancy to come to the window. <laughs> the beautiful Lancy. To think at any second she'll appear at that window. <laughs> oh, be still, me heart. To think. Very soon, Nancy! <laughs> Nancy, will you dine with me tonight? Yes. Mr. Bumble! Mr. Bumble! <laughs> Mr. Bumble, I have news for Mr. Bumble! Mr. Bumble, my old friend! Come here, Mr. Bumble! I have news to share with you! <laughs> 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 Nancy! Nancy's dining with me, Mr. Bumble! Bill Sykes! Bill Sykes, a try and stop her, Mr. Bumble! Oliver! Yes, that's it! Oliver, Mr. Bumble! Mr. Bumble! Oliver! Are you sure this time? <laughs> Oliver! <laughs> I'll get young Oliver to administer a draught. And while Bill Sykes sleeps, I'll be with Nancy. Oliver! Oliver! Where are you, boy? Come here, Oliver. Hello, sir. Oh, out here, lad. I can hear you very well from here, sir. Now, oh, here, lad. Don't be shy. <laughs> Put this in Bill Sykes' gin. Right away, sir. I've done it. I've done it at last. I've put one over on the evil swine. Soon I'll have her out of his arms and into mine. Nancy! Yes, Nancy! Oh. How shy she is. My bloody leg, that was. <laughs> And how it makes my blood boil to think of her in the arms of that evil man, that wicked man, that loathsome man. With you, thinking of me, sir. And Bill Sykes. Aha! You rogue. Aha! You villain. Aha! That fighting tall. Then fight. Wake up! All right! Ah! 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 What do we mean, next one? You die, you I die. die. Oh, I, 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 dead, dead. Nancy, Nancy. <laughs> Not quite dead. <laughs> Ever so nearly, good lad. I go now to die in some other place. <laughs> Magic! Oh, here comes Magic. That's him. Arnold! 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 Nancy! 
I can hear her coming down. Ah, here with those sweet. Ah. Come now, let you and me rejoice. Be gone, dull care and sorrow. Let's eat and drink, drink and eat until it be tomorrow. <laughs> Come, Nancy, sing a happy song of gaiety, not grief. Uh, come, Nancy, sing. How oh, can I with his wrong bloody teeth? I mean, look at them. Thank <laughs> you. 
a bouncer down at the local tally. Now she is a pin-up girl at the bowling alley. She's the most four-legged girl that you've set eyes upon. She walks up and down the alley while the game is going on. I blow girls in Liverpool. Hong Kong and the is that bull. I blow girls in Napoli. But by the truth, cause the only one for me. At hide and seek one day she gaily cried Now close your eyes and count to twenty while I go and hide And if you catch me I will let you steal a kiss from me And if you cannot find me I'll be right behind that tree I go girls in in a cottage in Rabout. The bed it was all broken and the spring was sticking out. But when I recall those moments, my heart it wants to sing. We kissed all through the winter and made love right through the spring. I don't go Uproar in the House at the Whitehall Theatre, London. I got a little present for you. Is it a surprise? I think you'll like it. Why, Harry, it's beautiful. <laughs> I don't like these experiments you keep doing, Harry. It's dangerous. I don't make mistakes. Never? Not Harry Johnson. Harry! <laughs> Haven't you noticed anything different about me? No? I'm wearing those new earrings you bought me. Well, bully for you, baby. <laughs> mm, bye. Bye. Don't forget Mary's coming over to dinner. Try and shoot at the duck. Yeah, okay, I'll do what I can do. Make sure you don't miss. <laughs> the most hideous thing I ever saw. Why, thank you. I had it on a top load. Hello, Annie Claire. Why, Timmy. My, how you've changed. Now, now, naughty, naughty, don't get mad. Here, honey, I've got something for you. Uh, can you catch? Yeah, sure I can. Yeah. What do you got to say to that, eh? Oh, yes. You've got a boy. A boy. And? And? A duck. A duck? <laughs> well, you never did shoot that duck you promised me, Harry. <laughs> no, he shot a monster instead. Ah! Oh, I Harry, shot I forgot him. <laughs> Poor old Billy Bunny, he didn't have a skin full last night. I wouldn't have his head this morning for all the tea in China. Ha 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 ha! 
Hey, 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 boys. Guys, guys, now, time for fun with Billy Bunn. And the time is now two minutes past 7 a.m. <laughs> It's a quest time, and here for Mrs. Eatwell of Sycamore Street. <laughs> Eaton, she would like either the grapefruit, or the cream, or the marmalade. Now, in the bubble, have you, Sir Mr. Bumble? Mr. Bumble, my old friend. Come here, Mr. Bumble. I've news to share with you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy's dining with me, Mr. Bumble. <laughs> Bill Sykes, Bill Sykes, a try and stop her, Mr. Bumble. <laughs> Oliver, yes, that's it, Oliver, Mr. Bumble. It's Mr. Bumble. Oliver, are you sure this time? <laughs> Oliver! <laughs> I'll get young Oliver to administer a draught. And while Bill Sykes sleeps, I'll be with Nancy! Oliver! Oliver! Where are you, boy? Come here, Oliver. Hello, sir. Oh, out here, lad. I can hear you very well from here, sir. Now, oh, here, lad. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hurry up, put this in Bill Sykes' gym. Right away, sir. I've got it. I've got it at last. I've put one over on the evil swine. Soon I'll have her out of his arms and into mine. Nancy! Yes, Nancy! <laughs> How shy she is. My bloody leg, that one. <laughs> and how it makes my blood boil to think of her in the arms of that evil man, that wicked man, that loathsome man. With you, thinking of me, sir. And Bill Sykes. Aha! You rogue. Aha! You villain. Aha! That fighting tall! Then fight! Wake up! Right. Ah. 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 What's me next one? You die. You I die. die. Oh. I. Ah. I. Ah. Dead. Dead. Nancy. Nancy. <laughs> Not quite dead. <laughs> ah, but ever so nearly, good lad. I go now to die in <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Jambon Tris. Cabinet on Fass. These are just some of the magnificent films from the French avant garde film director Claude Letuit. <laughs> Bonsoir. Mes hommages, cher maître. Merci. You know, you speak very well the French. <laughs> Merci. Now, for me, your most magnificent film was Cabinet on Fass. I think it was a masterstroke to make this beautiful girl who had this, this angst, this savoir-faire. She was so beautiful, so nearly perfect, yet you gave her a lisp. <laughs> Meaning that she wasn't really nearly no, so... No, no, you misunderstand. I, I don't give her a lisp. The actress who played the part, she has always lisp. <laughs> she, she always told like that. She always has the lisp. You searched all France for an actress with a lisp. No, 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 I, I don't find her. She was, she was discovered by a producer who was living with her at the time. <laughs> but I didn't want her in the film, but you know. Wonderful. Now, uh, to, to me, the best scene in the film was that scene in the restaurant, uh, when she looked up into his eyes and said, Je prends les mots, les manières. I want a life in the grand manner. No, 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 no. She says, uh, Je prends les moules marinières. <laughs> uh, I want mussel soup. <laughs> Their muscle soup. <laughs> she, she, she searched for her nourishment in, in, in the depths of, of the ocean. Yes, There's nothing more to be said. <laughs> and then in that scene at the end, where she's sitting alone in the great wastes of the Carmarg and the. <laughs> He's gone, and it wasn't the vicar, it was the doctor. I thought he was a bit familiar for the vicar. <laughs> the doctor says you've got flu, and it would be better if we were to occupy separate rooms for the next few days. Oh, poo! You know I don't like sleeping on my own. Well, that's what the doctor said. Uh, I suppose the doctor knows best. <laughs> Oh. 
Will that be all, sir? Uh, yes, thank you, Smithers. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, Smithers. <laughs> 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 what did the doctor have to say? He says we must keep to our separate rooms for another few days. Will you mind very much? So the doctor's over there. I'm sure he does. <laughs> in love with Edith. There the similarity ends, for George was bright and intelligent. Arthur just couldn't do anything right. George was athletic. Arthur was not. Billy Button, and the time is now two minutes past seven a.m. <laughs> it's press time, and here for Mrs. Eatwell of Sycamore Street. <laughs> Eaton, she would like either the grapefruit, or the cream, or the marmalade. Well, we've got one on the turntable for you now, and I'll tell you which one it is. It's a <laughs> Oh, ho, ho. well, here we go. Crazy man, crazy, crazy. to introduce the delightful Tammy Jones. Tiny letters underneath, we say no. <laughs> but I don't know any producer's wife. I know, but your wife wouldn't like to read that, would she, eh? <laughs> You'd have no cocoa for a fortnight. <laughs> go right off a marmalade, she would. But the BBC has no shoddy secrets. No? Then why is it that Billy Cotton never appears on the other channel? <laughs> I'll tell you cause why. Because he's being kept prisoner. <laughs> and only allowed out to do his show. Then he's locked away again in a little room next to the ticket allocation unit where no one ever goes. 
<laughs> yes, in the new Radio Times, I shall tell all just why Harry Seacombe dare not go back to his hometown of Glasgow. <laughs> Why a certain member of the Burt Rhodes Orchestra changed his sax? <laughs> Just how many of the black and white minstrels are illegal immigrants? <laughs> and the truth about Malcolm Muggeridge and Lulu? <laughs> but it won't always be exposing things. It will have its lighter side. I believe you've actually made a commercial about it. Yes, I have. So stand by, folks. It's all happening with the new Radio Times. <laughs> It's time to go, it's coming your way soon. The new radio time. It's educational. Outspoken. Men's fashion forum with friendly guests at all. Hurry work. Glamour with the lovely Dandy Nichols. <laughs> Provocative Kathleen Harrison. And Sultry Laura Hearn. Off duty with Alan Wicker. <laughs> Keep set with Cliff Mitchellmore. Readers complaint. I should like to complain about the standard of acting on Captain Scarlet and the Mr. On. <laughs> I have never seen such wooden performances in my whole life. <laughs> it's even worse than dead cars, and you can forgive them because they are puppets. <laughs> also, I should like to complain about the violence on commercial television. I think it's disgusting when they have a big P. <laughs> and they won't let it into the packet. <laughs> I think the programme is called Cannonball. <laughs> Also, some of the commercials are most misleading. One of them implies that if you use a certain kind of hair cream, you will become a black belt at Karachi. Well, Sycamore Street. <laughs> Eaton, she would like either the grapefruit, or the cream, or the marmalade. Well, we've got one on the turntable for you now. And I'll tell you which one it is. At the end. <laughs> oh, ho, ho. Well, here we go. Crazy man, crazy, crazy. pleasure to introduce the delightful Tammy Jones. Baby, don't 
for the evening. I bring you greetings from Moscow, from the Kremlin, from the Union of the Soviet and Sociable Republics, to the British gentlemen and ladies men who are at this moment sitting together in the privy of their own home. <laughs> we start off with typical Russian tavern dance. <laughs> Bouncer down at the local tally. Now she is a pin-up girl at the bowling alley. She's the most four-legged girl that you've set eyes upon. She walks up and down the alley while the game is going on. I've known girls in Liverpool, Hong Kong, and Burgundy's that bowl. I've known girls in Napoli, but by the truth, girls, the only one for me. At hide and seek one day she gaily cried Now close your eyes and count to twenty while I go and hide And if you catch me I will let you steal a kiss from me And if you cannot find me I'll be right behind that tree I go girls in Settled in a cottage in Rabalka, right of a marmalade she was. But that BBC has no shoddy secrets. No? Then why is it that Billy Cotton never appears on the other channel? <laughs> I'll tell you cause why. Because he's been kept prisoner. <laughs> and only allowed out to do his show. Then he's locked away again in a little room next to the ticket allocation unit where no one ever goes. <laughs> yes, in the new Radio Times, I shall tell all just why Harry Seacombe dare not go back to his hometown of Glasgow. <laughs> why a certain member of the Burt Rhodes Orchestra changed his sack. <laughs> just how many of the black and white minstrels are illegal immigrants. <laughs> And the truth about Malcolm Muggeridge and Lulu. <laughs> but it won't always be exposing things. It will have its lighter side. I believe you've actually made a commercial about it. Yes, I have. So stand by, folks. It's all happening with the new Radio Times. <laughs> it's time to go. It's coming your way soon. The new Radio Times. Men's fashion forum with friendly guests at Harry work. Glamour with the lovely Dandy Nichols. <laughs> Provocative Kathleen Harrison. And Sultry Laura Hearn. <laughs> Off duty with Alan Wicker. <laughs> Keep set with Cliff Mitchellmore. <laughs> Readers complaints.
I should like to complain about the standard of acting on Captain Scarlet and the Mr. On. <laughs> I have never seen such wooden performances in my whole life. <laughs> it's even worse than dead cars, and you can forgive them because they are puppets. <laughs> also, I should like to complain about the violence on commercial television. I think it's disgusting when they have a big P. <laughs> and they won't let it into the packet. <laughs> I think the program is called Cannonball. <laughs> also, some of the commercials are most misleading. One of them implies that if you use a certain kind of hair cream, you will become a black belt at Karachi <laughs> and Jewish Jitsu. <laughs> also, that you will be a junior executive and drive around in a fast continental sports car and have a mad Mayfair model to accompany you. I have been using that hair cream for 12 